Hey, good morning all, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's good evening for me and I believe for you, Doug, it's good afternoon. Um, welcome here and welcome for all the people that are here. Um, we're going to have an interesting chat, an interesting hour. Uh, and I'm here with Doc Thompson. And Doug, if you can say a few words about yourself in terms of what you're doing, where you're coming from, and what it is you bring today to the show. It's amazing to be here. This is my first LinkedIn event, I think. So this is sort of exciting. There's so many platforms now for streaming. And we're just at the beginning because the metaverse is going to give us a whole new set of options. And that's my background. I've been working in, in the metaverse, on the metaverse, on metaverse projects for about 15 years. Um, currently, I'm working on a project called EchoCore, where I'm co founder. Uh, I'm also head of marketing for the Open Meta DAO, which is dedicated to an open metaverse. Uh, and I'm also advising a number of other projects. Most, almost all of them related to the metaverse. So it's exciting to be here. Very exciting. Thank you very much for that. And for the ones that know me, because I've only done one of these shows, so I'm not very familiar, I guess. Um, I'm here and I'm part of a group that's called Threefold, um, who was building a decentralized version of the internet, which I think is really important. And the DigiByte Foundation and Threefold together have created DigiCore and Digi3 as a joint strategic partnership to actually bring experiences to enterprises that are different than what we know today. And, and that's what Doug and I are going to dig a little bit deeper into in terms of what we're facing here, what we're experiencing, and what, exci what exciting times we're part of in terms of going forward. And, and maybe the first thing to start off, try to un un unravel is, I mean, Web 2.0, we know it, we're, we're using it as we speak. Um, it's brought us a lot because we are in very different places in the world that we can still communicate and talk and, and, and this is working fluent. And like you said, Doug, I mean, LinkedIn is a new platform, but it's a platform that allows us to, to speak and to, to go to audiences globally. And, but I think still Web 2.0 was still very much like what our real life experience was of a book, right? It's 2D, you've got pages, they go through, you read, you might watch a movie, you might watch some video content, but that's what it is. So now all these people talk about Web 3.0, and, and can you tell me a little bit, or can you tell us a little bit, sorry, what that means to you and what you seek and see in Web 3.0? Oh, that's a really interesting question, and I'll, I'll cross it over, I think, just talking a little bit about what the metaverse is, because it's become a bit of a confusing term, to be honest with you. Uh, you and I were talking before the show about the fact that 15 years ago, we, I had a show called Metanomics, and it, and it um, covered the cultural, economic, all of the stuff about the metaverse, which at the time we thought had a very specific definition. And the metaverse, there was only ever going to be one. Technically, there can only be one metaverse, just like there's only one internet. And technically, it was this idea of a series of interconnected spatial 3d spatial environments that you could easily travel between similar to how you can move from one website to another i think web3 is emerging at the same time as all of this discussion about what you know what is the metaverse and how many metaverses will there be and web3 um, are all facilitating technologies based on blockchain that allow us to get back to the heart of what I always thought the internet would be, which is a decentralized um, communication tool, uh, place where you could express your identity, uh, commercial platform. So those two things I think are happening at the same time. The first is that computers are becoming spatial. Uh, computing power has become sufficient that we can actually simulate reality in a 3D way. And the, the emerge of these new decentralized tools, and I think those two things together is super powerful. And, and they are. And, and again, like you said, we talked earlier. And, and the one thing I remembered uh, is that when I started using the internet, you, you said it earlier, like it had these beeping sounds, which you got first. That was sort of like yeah, the modem. 
the sound of the modem. The modem. It was like entering it. And, and then you knew you were connected. And then you had like a whole world in front of you, which you could discover. But I think the point is that it was people to people, person to person. And, and again, coming from a science background, I mean, I used to use the internet a lot to find and talk to researchers and scientists on the other side of the world. And literally, you were talking from a desktop on my desk to a desktop on the other guy. And if he had done a proper job, he even did his research paper in HTML, which meant you could read it through a browser, right? Which was a fantastic experience. Fast forward, and again, I'm not here to diss where we are, but fast forward, we're now in a world which is dominated by monopolies or oligopolies, however you want to call them. And, and there's always this third party in the middle, which brings service, which brings convenience, which brings a lot of things that we do on a daily basis. Again, we're using it right now, and it's it's fantastic to, to do so. But I think this whole play is as well, and you talked about identity and talking about going back to the roots, people to people. I think this is where this is all driving us, that somehow, somewhere deep down in us, we want to go back to being a person online, being able to express ourselves and being able to do that without this third party being in the middle and actually giving us an experience, almost like a frame. This is what you can do, and this is how you should be doing it. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. And maybe we should dig a little bit deeper in, into what you said earlier, experience of, of, of the metaverse. Like, I mean, how do you, and what is your opinion about this, this ability to be either between anonymous or between having an identity? I think those are the two extremes on the spectrum. And We've had all of the versions uh, out there. Where, where should we go? What, what's, what's your feel in terms of what the future should be? Yeah, you know, I think we have this opportunity with the, the metaverse, with the emergence of the metaverse and space that people sense it. They've got a pretty good idea that it's, I, I love the expression that Ryan Gill, who I work with at the Open MetaDAO uses, which, where he says that the metaverse is the internet built by game developers. So it's this idea that, you know, you, you were talking about the fact that your kids play games. I'm a big gamer. I love those spaces. I love the feeling of going into a different world. I love the feeling that those worlds have stories attached to them. And things I can do, everything from uh, driving, doing a test drive of a car to attending a music con conference. I'm here in Ibiza where next week there's a big music conference and a full day of the schedule is about the music in the metaverse. And that never would have been possible years ago. So why do I say that? I say that because I think we've got a chance to fix the mistakes we've made. And one of the first mistakes I think that was made in the early internet uh, was that every, we assumed that everybody would know each other. That was the actual assumption that we're just going to be communicating computer to computer. So I'm, I'm going to know that it doesn't matter what screen name you use, know who it is that I'm chatting with because you're my colleague at this university across the country. And so identity uh, was not a specification of the early internet. Understanding like who is, you know, who you are was not a requirement of the early internet. So what happened was that the incentive structure around identity uh, ended up being driven commercially by the big silos that you just talked about. Facebook had an interest in making sure that we use our reels. And in fact, they made very strong policy decisions that did not allow you to be anonymous, for example, on Facebook. And I think that the incentive structure for, uh, for Facebook was that if they know who you are, they can collect all kinds of data, that data to advertise to you. So I think we made some mistakes in the early design of the internet. And now we have this new toolkit, uh, blockchain based uh, identity systems being a prominent one of Web3. And it allows us to start to think about, well, what was wrong? What was the problem? And I think there's two layers to this. One is that I would like to have personal choice as to how much I reveal about myself in different spaces. Mm -hmm. Because it may be that if I go to a work space, a work conference in the metaverse, for example, that I do want to reveal my name, but that if I'm going to a music conference, maybe I don't, right? So I want to have personal choice. But the part, that, the part that's missing has been the trust layer. And I think we need to think of um, identity as having those two 
components. The first is choices, personal choice, personal um, agency around revealing who we are. But then the second is that that needs to be attached to a trust layer so that if I ch do choose to be anonymous, uh, that there is some accountability and responsibility, which brings me to a very, very big point around, because if you talk about things like identity and the very big point is this is a new form of citizenship. We are all becoming citizens of the metaverse. We're all becoming citizens of Web3, which comes with both responsibility and a communal requirement that we come together and talk about what, what these things mean and how those things relate to enterprises and the, and the organizations uh, that we're going to relate to. Very true. And thank you for uh, just kind of riffing. <laughs> it out. I just want to make the audience also aware that we are seeing questions that come in. So if there are any questions that are relevant to where we are, then, then please put them. Um, we want to address them as and when they occur and as and when they are relevant, because at the end of it, it's, it's maybe difficult to go back to, to all of those different topics. So having said that, please put them in. We'll see them. We'll get back to it. We'll make a pause and, and actually uh, try to answer them. So that thing about identity and about being yourself, I mean, for me, the big step is that we're making, and I, I said it earlier, like this book 2D experience, I mean, nothing wrong with that, but a book is a very passive thing, right? And real life is a very different thing because we all interact and we all have um, relationships. We know people and people tell about other people. And if, again, for, for certain things, you, you go to people that you know one or two degrees away from you, right? I think that's where, and I hope that that's where this metaverse will take us. Because like you said, there's going to be many metaverses, right? There's going to, not going to be one. And let's get the elephant in the room uh, addressed <laughs> as well. I mean, obviously, yeah. Obviously, Facebook claimed that space uh, because they do have a lot of users worldwide. Uh, they were very successful in creating convenience for people to communicate to each other, for them to harvest data and to use data to very interestingly uh, market things to us and 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 maybe even i don't know because i've never worked for facebook but even sell data that they collect and so on and so on and so on right but that taking that third party in the middle and that convenience factor out of the equation does put back owners and responsibility back on us individuals and and there we are again, back at the individual, the people-to-people -people relationship that we have in real life, which is now becoming also part of our digital life. And I personally think that that is a beautiful thing that is happening. Again, there will be some positives and some negatives around that, but, but I really see that we can benefit, and I try to do it on a daily basis where I am and what I'm, what I'm doing to sort of mimic what we do today in our real lives or what nature has taught us. And... I hope that that is what the metaverse also will allow us to do so and, 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 and take it forward. Yeah, I think, I think we're certainly going to be conscious of moving between different spaces. Like if you enter the meta Facebook section of the metaverse, I think you're going to be aware that it has a different uh, attitude towards data surveillance and all that kind of stuff. And I think, um, and I think, it's important to realize that with the metaverse, the amount of data that's being that can be captured, and I've done some advising to the XR Safety Initiative, which is a global initiative looking at safety in XR, so VR, AR. When you think about the amount of data that, that can get collected, imagine if you were walking down Main Street and that there were cameras all around Main Street and that those cameras could capture where your eye is looking. Did I look at the pair of shoes in that shop window? Did I look at that you know, piece of cake? Did I look at that ad? How long did I look at that ad? And right. then imagine as well that they could measure your pulse, that they could measure all kinds of body signals. That's what's going to be possible in the metaverse. And I think people will become aware of this and will want to take some personal accountability and then I think because we're talking as well about enterprise, I think it's important for enterprise to realize that there may be a cultural shift as Web3 takes hold and as the metaverse starts to grow. Enterprise needs to realize that they need to create a, a relationship 
with their communities and they're going to need to make some decisions about what those relationships look like. So I, I, A, people are going to become aware of how much data is being captured. We already kind of know. There's going to be these parts of the metaverse where you're going to be able to make choices about your identity and your wallet and what you buy and who you're relating to. And that's facilitated by Web3. And that's going to make us kind of wake up and say, oh, you know what? I better kind of take some responsibility for, for example, just keeping my wallet safe for making decisions about, you know, what I reveal about myself. So there's a cultural shift happening, which I think is pretty profound. Absolutely. There's a couple of questions which have come in and, and I said I would address them as they are. So let's do that. Yeah. And if I to put them together and, and sort of put them into one frame, it, it's about what would you do anonymous or public or what, how would you have a single identity in all of these these verses or metaverses? Um, and I think it's, 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 it's back to, and I always try, like I said, I always try to go back to real life, right? It's a choice that you have if and when you find where you want to store your identity and where you want to be verified. Because in the end, identity is all about verification. And whether that is peer because you know people or whether that is government because you live somewhere or you have a password somewhere, right? That's all going to be yeah. developed. But it's a, it's a choice where you as an individual want to be verified and where you believe that you've got enough trust built around you by either your community, your friends, your government, your tennis club, your football club. It doesn't really matter to that degree because all of those things mean something to other people around you. And you've said it earlier, you want to disclose part of your identity to people that you think are relevant. And I think that's what it needs to become. You choose as an individual where you want to have that done. There's going to be certain requirements put forward by authorities, by all sorts of officials and so on. But for the remaining part, you will decide where you have it. And that, there's going to be many. Um, what, what do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, I think there will be, there will be many. I, I, so I have this concept of um, permissions in the metaverse. And it, stra it harkens back. There's a fellow named uh, Eben Moglen. He started the electronic, I'll never remember the name, the Electronic Freedom Foundation, I think it was called. And he had this saying about the metaverse that he wanted to feel like he was walking into a clean, well-lit room. So what did he mean by that? What he meant was that when you enter spaces in the metaverse, that you have a sense of what the rules are and that you feel comfortable entering those spaces uh, because it's a clean, well-lit room. Okay, so my concept here was that typically right now, you sign off on terms and conditions on every website that you sign up for. And it's usually these big, long 12 page things, with dense legal language. You never read it. I mean, I, you know, most people don't read it. Um, so, but why can't those things be carried in your avatar? And I, I would love to see, this is just kind of a concept, but I would love to see this idea that my avatar itself broadcasts, my, my preferences to the spaces that I enter. For example, I may prefer not to see violence. I don't want to see hyper-realistic violence. I may prefer not to be surveyed. In other words, I don't want to have any data collected about me. I would like to carry those preferences around as I move through the metaverse and then have each space do a handshake with my data packet, with the metadata about my permissions. So I think we have this opportunity with Web3 to kind of like flip things, invert things, uh, change our typical ways of how we've thought about identity and data and uh, know your customer and all of that kind of stuff. So I, do, I don't think there's going to be one solution, and I certainly hope there isn't, because that probably would mean that we've, we've trended back towards centralization again. But I think that we will see things uh, that are quite creative I think we'll see some really creative technical solutions to these things. I mean, already, you know, there are systems where because there are legal requirements sometimes to provide your identity, to prove who you are, that those things can be actually, uh, uh, sec you know, secured off so that the platform owners don't have access to them, for example. So I think we're seeing interesting, it'll be an interesting time. But again, back to what you were saying, we have a responsibility as the users to figure out which systems we're comfortable with. 
Yeah, and again, to, to take that one step further in, in terms of my words, uh, I don't think that is very unlike what we do in real life again, because I really want to go back to what we do in real life. If we enter a public space, we yeah. normally behave, right? That's, that's, that's always the, the, the one that doesn't or the one that, that sort of stands out. But 99% of people just know what they need to do and need to how to behave. And that's been very different in this digital world because that has gone completely, my words, bananas in, in terms of being doing all sorts of silly <laughs> things. So, um, but, but beyond that, and, and that responsibility thing that you just said is also really important because everything that we have, and this is maybe where the weird behavior came from. And again, let me try to, to dig this out a little bit with you. Like, since there is no sense of repercussion or sense of, control on this digital 2D or web 2.0 that we had so far, yeah, people did all sorts of weird things. And the convenience factor of doing it, because these public spaces in the digital world were not really well governed beyond signing those T's and C's and saying that you wouldn't do yes. anything, right? But there was no, again, digital police, there was no nothing. I mean, in forums, yes, you've got these um, people that, that, that control the forums, but, but in most places, not really. So I think that's where, if and when we go to this metaverse, if we go to this metaverse, and we will have to take self-responsibility, we will have to start to behave. And, and I think this is, is shown in a very simple way with, with digital currencies, which have been around for a decade now. And there is just no way that if and when you make a transaction which is wrong, that you can call someone and say, hey, I want my money back because I pushed it to the wrong endpoint wallet right? right that's exactly right now and, and people understand that bit already you're in control you need to keep your private key very securely in, in in the way that you feel comfortable with and then manage it yourself and i think what the metaverse will show us is that that will go much further and will put again authority responsibility in our own hands and and maybe and again i'm not a a psychologist or I, I i haven't studied the human psyche that much but maybe that puts us also back in a position where we we do behave differently because again we're our own individual we're responsible for what we do and we need to just be a digital citizen yeah i mean that's a, that's a super interesting that last point one of my favorite people is a anthropologist named tom bolstorff out of ucla who has studied digital communities and I think one of the breakthroughs of this, this was a breakthrough at the time, was that he proposed that you could study communities in digital spaces the same way that an anthrop anthropologist would travel to Samoa, study a tribe in Samoa. And I think that was the big breakthrough, was that he was saying like all of these cultural um, habits the ways that we act, the things that we do in digital spaces, how I act in Grand Theft Auto, for example, might be quite different from how I act on Roblox. Like the language I use, the way that I dress my avatar, the way I express myself. And that's very similar, as you're saying, to real life. The way that I act at work might be quite different than the way that I act if I'm a player and I'm playing on a soccer team. You know, there's a, those are two different personas that I'm bringing. And I think the interesting thing here, so one of the things that OpenMeta has done is built the software kit called Emergence. And the, I'll just share a little bit about the philosophy with it is that it's a software toolkit that for the end user will allow them to switch personas as they move through the metaverse. So I can pull up my Bored Ape persona when I enter one particular place, and then I can pull up my business suit and tie when I go into another space. But why is it important? It's important because I'm inventory around with me. It's not sitting there in a silo. It's not sitting on a server owned by Facebook or Fortnite or whoever. It's not on a side. I'm carrying my inventory with me as I move from place to place. And that I think is the big difference. And for enterprises, I think this cultural shift, um, I think companies are going to have to start to rethink what their relationships are with the communities that they serve, whether it's customers, whether it's their employees, uh, because this shift of uh, asset power, where do the assets sit, 
means that enterprise is going to have to come up with new conventions, new cultural relationships with you where I say, hey, I'd like to have a little bit of information from you. And I'm not, I, I don't have permission to just suck that information up. We're going to have to work together to figure out how to, ha- how to have a relationship. So I think this is, this is going to be a really big, profound cultural shift that frankly, I think is going to shake entire industries, industries that have have become used to as much data as I want on my customers because I just have to go and buy it to no, now I actually have to create a relationship with these customers and have them give permission for sharing that data. So that's a big, that's a big, uh, that's a big shift. And maybe an open door, but do you think the current Infrastructure layer, and I'm sitting here as an infrastructure nerd, obviously. Um, do you think that's ready for that? Because, again, the convenience factor in terms of, like you said, you store your assets on something central silo, right? You you have your bank account with a bank. You, I mean, all of those things are centralized instances that we're used to that present convenience, that do things for us. I think this next decade or maybe faster than that is going to be a massive change for individuals, but also for enterprises, as you said, to need to get to understand this new reality where individuals are going to take back a lot of that data ownership, are going to take back a lot of that data um, sharing and decisions on data sharing that they have. And yeah, they might they might dry up. And I guess, uh, I guess the likes of yeah. uh, Elon Elon Musk with his car that collects data has done a very smart move 10 years ago to do that because there must be, oh, there might be a button very soon somewhere that says no more. And uh, yes. yeah, uh, how, how are industries going to change with that? What, what, what do you think will Yeah, let, will let's, let's make that, yeah, let's make that super practical. You know, the metaverse means uh, a couple things to me. The metaverse means that everything is spatial. So it means that I can, if you watch your kid play, or, or if you play games, if you jump on PlayStation, you're playing a game and you're moving around a 3D environment. So that's spatial. But the same will be true as you walk around your neighborhood. And we're going to see VR turn into mixed reality so that your VR goggles start to, you know, be, you'll be able to see the world around you instead of it being, you know, closed off. So the physical and digital worlds are going to merge. And I'll eventually, five years from now, a pair of glasses about as less, I'll be able to walk around my neighborhood and see digital overlays as I, as I move around. But to get there, we're not ready for that. Um, when you play a game on PlayStation, the reason you're able to play it is that it downloads a lot of content before you can even turn the game on, right? So how are we going to distribute all of this? Forget about entity and your personal inventory But what about these worlds that we're talking about building that you'll be able to enter? And what you're talking about with Tesla, Apple has done the same thing. Facebook is doing the same thing. It's glasses, Snapchat. They're mapping uh, Niantic, the makers of Pokemon. They're mapping the whole world. They're creating a 3D map of the whole world. How we distribute that, the infrastructure is not there yet. And I think that that infrastructure will, by necessity, need to be more decentralized that people talk about edge computing and 5g that's a hint of it but then to decentralize it and to actually make everybody a node in the network as somebody said in the chat that's not just an identity node but that may also be an inventory and that's how we contribute to this kind of massive you know spatial computing uh, web and I think therein lies a very big challenge for the current leaders in, in let's say, the internet providers. Because yes. PS5 only works because you've got like a super duper graphical machine sitting on your desktop, right, connected to your screen, which you're using, or connected to your goggles today. And that's why you can get that rendered world in the detail that you get. Yes. It doesn't work over a line that is a thousand miles long. It just doesn't work. So. If and when we want this metaverse to start to happen, this whole data center needs to start to be decentralized. So you need to have almost like a data center in your neighborhood or a data center in your house even. I think that's where all of this will drive us to. And I think that's that's beautiful personally because I'm involved in something that does that, which is obviously uh, 
it's my, my passion to do so. But I think all of these things together will make it a very different experience and will give power back to the individual, power back to the organization, power back to the company doing right. so. And then one thing I, yeah, I, I agree. you said it a few times. So so what what do let's forget about these these giants that exist today. So what does a company or how should enterprises that are now intrigued about this metaverse and are wanting to get involved, right? Are wanting to invest or even start to experience. Well, where should they start? What what challenges are they facing? I mean, it's it's a digital world. It's a digital market. They have been selling goods online, which is okay. But this is going to be different, I think, because there's going to be digital goods, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, it depends because enterprise is such a broad term. I mean, I would love to know yes. from the audience too what types what types of enterprises you guys are from but i guess i would I, I would probably put it into three big buckets the first big bucket is jensen huang of nvidia believes that the gdp of the metaverse will exceed that of the entire planet so he believes that the metaverse itself is going to be so imagine i said to you well, by the way there's a new country that's forming it's just it's just off the coast it's out in the water there's this new country that's forming and it's going to be bigger than the United States. The GDP of this country is going to be massive. Oh, some people are saying we froze. Um, that the GDP of this country is going to be massive. So wouldn't you want to understand how to take advantage of that market? If that's something, depending on the type of enterprise you are, if you're selling, um, if you're, if you're selling something. So that's one. Two is if you have if you if your enterprise is involved in anything spatial. So let's think about what that means. If you if you create something that's three dimensional, means that we could actually create highly accurate digital reproductions of that. Whether it's a car, a bike, a widget, uh, a machine, a tool, right? So if you do anything that's three dimensional. Uh, and if you do anything that's spatial, so what is spatial? A factory floor is spatial. And in theory, I could create a real time of your factory floor and I could send repair people in from the other side of the planet to go in and, you know, review what's happening on the factory floor. So that's the second, you know, that's, that's this big bucket. So big bucket one is this is going to be a huge market. Bucket two is if you do anything that's spatial, whether you create things that are three-dimensional or you have a spatial component to your work, that would be, I think, the, the second big bucket. And then the third is, uh, we've already seen this with the pandemic, that these ideas of companies needing to be in a silo, meaning an office building, I think, I think we've now proven that that isn't necessary. It, and it's been accelerated through through the pandemic because I mean, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been working with people all over the world for a long time, but that got supercharged over the last couple of years. And imagine what happens when I can have a, a video call like this, but that I could see you in the room right next to me as if you're actually here, I could see a hologram of you and that's where we're headed. So those are the three, I think those are the three areas that, that if I was in guys, depending, depending on, what type of business I have, I would be saying which of those three is the most promising as a space for innovation in order to just, you know, learn about where all of this is headed and not be left behind when it, when the wave comes through. But I think like you look at something like uh, digital fashion, um, I think fashion designers today who make physical pieces of clothing and, and have to chip them across the ocean to some mall down the street, they may eventually make as much money designing digital fashion, which has no shipping costs, no material costs, no environmental footprint. They can, they'll make as much money with digital fashion as they do with physical fashion. It's an example of the type of change that's coming. And what I like really like about that, because you know that I'm very big on decentralization, because again, the designer designs, right? And he's got the right to earn through that. 
but production is now going back to local communities. It's going back to where you actually want to wear that fashion, right? It, it creates local jobs or potentially it creates local jobs. It creates and enhances the local economy. So I think that is a really interesting aspect where I think businesses, enterprises, whatever we call them, can get and wrap their heads around that that is now something that really can be very helpful for the planet and, and, and make the planet go back to Again, physical life as we know it, back in the days, you lived on a farm, you produced your own food, you had your own community around you. This gives right. you a chance to do so and on a global scale. And I think that is a beautiful thought and also a beautiful circle that we go through. Um, trying to go back to the questions, and I'm not sure if I interpret them right, but it says, uh, answer your own question, what is the point of the event? Well, the point of the event is to to hopefully inspire, inspire ideas, inspire thoughts, inspire ways of, of looking at this. Again, when I when I first started talking about this, the first thing that came to me with Metaverse and, and this 3D experience was what I see my kids doing, right? They've been running around 3D worlds for quite a bit. They're very good at it. And even I in my days, I don't play games anymore, but even I in my days did it with the earlier versions of that. So it, in that sense, it's nothing new. But if we can now apply it to make what we do on this digital medium better and, and more alike, I've said it many times before, what we do in real life, then I think that is a really, really well, game up almost or, or level up for for the internet that we know. And, and again, responsibility back in our hands, being responsible citizens, digital citizens, being responsible businesses, doing it in a responsible way. All of those things are now an opportunity that we can get stuck into and involved in. And that's to me really exciting and i hope that this call uh, and this event <laughs> speaks a little bit towards that um yeah i think i think mark was making a point about this this thing i mean i'm not following the full thread but mark was talking about algorithmic financial consequences and that speaks a little bit to the emergence of DAOs as another uh thread in this story that i think is super important uh we're certainly doing that at open meta with open meta is to support an open metaverse an open metaverse means giving control back i want to own my inventory i don't want to rent it if i'm playing a game and i buy a skin like i would in fortnite i don't want to just be renting that skin and having it sit you know on the fortnite servers i want to be able to take that skin with me to other places so this the idea that a dao can be formed to uh, try to tackle some of these really huge uh, questions of governance, community, what types of technology needs to be built. I think that has an important lesson for enterprise as well, because I, I think uh, companies typically look down the street to see where their competition is coming from. They look for, you know, which corporation has been formed that they need to keep an eye out right they need to keep an eye on but i think DAOs become your next competitor that communities will be able to form together uh because they want to uh i know for example marty marty's in the chat there's a group that's trying to buy, buy back blockbuster you know the old video rental chain and turn it into a DAO for the next hollywood storytelling so that's your next competitor for Netflix or MGM or some one of these guys. So another interesting piece because what is a DAO? A DAO is both about governance and it's about introducing, as Mark was saying, algorithmic financial consequences to our decisions. And I think we're at the very, very uh, earliest days of um, of figuring some of this out. Like, what will that governance look like? What will accountability look like? How will we hold enterprise itself? How will we hold companies responsible? Um, and there's there's a flip side to some of this too. For example, the right to be forgotten, which is actually a law in the UK. And it was this, this idea that engines never forget. Well, neither does the blockchain. And so there is the, you know, there's some interesting ethical issues around things like right to be forgotten, equality, um, and I just think it's a super intriguing going through. Yeah, totally, totally, totally agree. Um, 
and there is, but I won't play the nerd in this call. <laughs> there are many ways that you can make a blockchain forget as well. Um, yeah. But let, let's not go there because yeah, they yeah. haven't necessarily been implemented. Um, politics, government driven initiatives. Um, yeah, I, I guess if I read that question well, um, the thing that bothers me, and, and again, that's the infrastructure guy speaking in this call. Huh? I mean, the way we currently serve, let's say, underserved communities or, 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 or people that are not necessarily um, very close by and in living thriving in, in thriving economies is by creating longer cables. And I don't know if, if people realize that, but all of the big guys that today present very usable and good services and clouds and what have you and social platforms, I mean, they're all investing in sea cables. They're all investing in connecting countries, which which tells you one thing. I mean, this whole centralization, there's even another one that is shooting satellites in the sky to make the cable even longer and go through space. So everybody's investing, weirdly enough, in actually making the centers that are there, the silos that are there, better connected to all of the citizens that they don't connect to yet on this planet. And that, I think that in itself is something that, that needs to be addressed as well, where you go back to, right. as you said, communities, that PlayStation thing. I mean, the metaverse is only going to work if you have that PlayStation capability very near to you. That cable that goes through space will not give you that experience. And like you said earlier, Doug, because it's not just having that stream. I mean, Netflix will work like a charm through those longer cables. I mean, it does. But once you start to interact, once you start to move, right, once you start to look at different things and, and new scenes need to be rendered or digital interactions need to start to happen between two avatars or two individuals, that's when a lot of data needs to be sent back and forth. And yeah. that is just not going to work through a longer cable. So we really need to rethink that whole, and again, those data centers are going to be part of the metaverse and there will be an instrumental part of it. I mean, they're not going away and we don't need them to go away, but it needs to be augmented with something that is closer to all of us and certainly in those underserved communities, which again, is a, is a big part of my life these days. Um, um, yeah, I mean, any anything that, that you feel that we haven't touched upon or anything that I've not challenged you well, with? Well, you know, we use, we use the term decentralization, which I think is great. But it, to me, it's about the people. The thing that I, I am getting so excited about, and, and I th for example, I think Discord itself is a kind of prototype meta because you're able to move between different worlds, change your identity when you get there, change your name. Like it has all of the kind of uh, feelings of, of a kind of proto metaverse. The reason I mention it is the thing that has me excited, and we were talking about this before, was that I used to log on to the, in, 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 onto the internet 20 years ago and pretty much know the people that I was intera interacting with because you'd jump into a discussion and you'd see the same people that you saw last night. I don't get that yep. when I'm streaming through a social media feed. Like I do, you sort of, I, I mean, I've been on Twitter for something like 12 years, so I recognize a couple of names, but mostly it just sort of flows by. And I think one of the things that's super exciting about decentralization and the metaverse is it brings us into closer contact with smaller communities. And that's a, a just part of the nature of the beast. Like when I'm, when I'm logging into a 3D environment, yes, you will be able to have 4,000 people in one 3D space attending a concert. But more often than not, when I'm in the metaverse, I'm going to be with fairly small groups. of, And I think that's the, I think that's the super thing part of what is now re being revealed as the metaverse emerges is we're finding ourselves back in these communities. We're finding ourselves creating things with people whose names we know, whether it's their screen name or their real name. Uh, and that is unleashing, uh, I think, a new form of creativity. Uh, Marty asked the question about storytelling in the metaverse, and I would actually use the term lore. I think we're returning to an era of lore. And there's some really great thinking, for example, about the role of lore enterprise. Storytelling is marketing. If I'm, an, if I'm a brand, 
if I tell a story, I'm just, I'm, I'm marketing. Lore is what happens when a community takes story and takes ownership of it. So I think uh, the thing I don't want to lose track of when we talk about decentralization and identity and the metaverse is that we're, we're finding our families again, that what's exciting about it is that I'm not just another name in a constant stream of social media. I'm not just somebody working in a cubicle company, but that I'm finding people who are, who I have an affinity to that we can create things together because we have these new tools. And so innovation is going to happen at the grassroots. Innovation is going to happen because it's fitted by lore as a system for sharing knowledge and for sharing wisdom. And I think the, this is, this is going to challenge enterprise who is already struggling, for example, with the whole, whole question of going back to the office. Like, oh my God, we want people back in the office so we can get control back. I think that that horse has left the stable. I don't, I, I don't think if enterprise is, it's a command and control world, I think that world is ending. And that what we need to do is to learn to uh, create, you know, create webs of trust within the enterprise so that these small affinity groups, these small communities, these small parts of the organization can innovate from the grassroots up, facilitate it. All of that, all of that culture, all of that community, all of those families facilitated because it is decentralized. Beautifully said, and and it almost feels like if I listen to you, like we've diverged away from social constructs that have been with us for many thousands of years by this digital medium, which has done a lot of good for us, but also created a lot of craziness. And and now we're yes. we're converting, <laughs> and that's Look, that's a beautiful watch, thought to, to yeah. Have. Watch a, watch a couple of kids building in Minecraft, setting up their own Minecraft server. Exactly. That's it. You get four or five kids. They've got their own Minecraft server. They're going in. They're creating little villages. They're having a little game. They're doing whatever they're doing. That's the future of enterprise right there. That to me, that's the future. That's what, that's where we're headed. And it's exciting. I find it you, super exciting. It is because we've got like well-trained generations coming because they've done that. <laughs> they've lived that. They know how that is. And, and, and they will thrive in this, in this new, very interesting world. So thank you so much for your time. If there's no closing comments or questions that we need to address in this call, I think I would like to bring I think I think Philip had I think Philip had the best closing comment. As a consumer, I don't want to be bombarded with advertising. So if that's the core use, it won't excite me very much. And I'm totally yep. <laughs> if if it's Facebook, if if Facebook's idea of the metaverse is a bunch of malls where I can buy uh, shoes, count me out. I'm not interested. Same here. Got enough shoes. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doug. It was a pleasure to uh, to have this talk with you. Have a great convention. Uh, Thank you. Trade show in uh, in Ibiza, and um, yeah, looking forward to the next one. Thank you, audience. I hope it was meaningful to you. I hope it helped you to to understand what views are in terms of how this metaverse can develop itself. And let's now try to make it a reality with, with all of us. I mean, that's with all of us that we can participate in, and, and, and do this. So thank you so much. Have a great weekend if you're heading into the weekend. And uh, looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye. sir. Bye, everybody. Thank you.